presidential candidate and Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard respond to rumors the Russian government is backing her campaign? Does she worry about allegations that a new batch of Democrats is spreading anti-Semitism? She's live on The View next. ABC. Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard has achieved many firsts in her career. She's the first American Samoan and the first Hindu member of Congress, as well as the youngest woman ever elected to state legislature. Now she wants to add first female president of the United States to her resume. So please give a warm aloha to Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. Thank you very much. Well, we always ask everybody who's running yes. here, why? Why are you doing it? <laughs> <laughs> you have that crazy look in your face. <laughs> um, you know, after 9-11, like so many Americans, uh, I wanted to do something to serve and protect our people and our country. Uh, so I enlisted in the Army National Guard, uh, volunteered <coughs> to deploy to Iraq, and in uh, 2012, along with Congress or now Senator Tammy Duckworth, became one of the first uh, female combat veterans uh, ever elected to Congress. It is those values of uh, service before self that every soldier, every service member represents that I want to bring to the White House to reinstill those values of of honor, uh, integrity, and respect to the presidency. Very brave of you to join up like that. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's my uh, honor to serve. Sure. Thanks. Now, um, how did your experience fighting in Iraq shape your outlook uh, of the United States' role in foreign policy? Because uh, in my research, I found that you have a strict non-interventionist approach, and you are against the United States entering countries and uh, being there for this sort of regime change. Yeah, yeah. no, as a, uh, as a soldier, I deployed with our, our brigade combat team from Hawaii. I volunteered to deploy with them to Iraq in 2005, uh, which was the height of, of the conflict there. Mm -hmm. uh, I served in a medical unit where every single day I was confronted with, uh, in a heart-wrenching way, the high human cost of war. The very first thing I did every single morning was go down a list of names of every single American uh, casualty, every single service member who had been injured the day before. And I had to see if any of our uh, brigade soldiers were on that list to make sure they got the care that they needed or to evacuate them as quickly as possible. But as I went through this list every single day, um, I was struck. Uh, with the names and the faces of my brothers and sisters who were paying the price uh, for this war. I was struck with their, their families, their loved ones at home, uh, who were so stressed and so anxious uh, for the well-being of their loved ones. Uh, it is those experiences of understanding and knowing firsthand the cost of war, both on our service members, on our veterans, uh, as well as uh, the cost on the people in the countries where we intervene, uh, as well as the trillions of dollars, our taxpayer dollars that are spent on waging these wars, dollars that are sorely needed uh, to address the very real urgent needs of, of our families, our communities, our neighbors right here at home. So should we not get involved when we see atrocities abroad? We have to understand, looking at Iraq, Libya, and Syria, for example, uh, that there are brutal dictators in the world. And unfortunately, there are people who are suffering as a result of that. But in so many examples throughout history, when the United States takes action and intervenes and launches these regime change wars to topple these dictators, the suffering of the people in these countries increases. Uh, their lives are made uh, worse off than they were before. There is far more death uh, and destruction. Uh, Libya is a perfect example. Muammar Gaddafi was toppled. Uh, now, today, we have more uh, terrorist groups in Libya than ever before. We have Libyan people, women and children, being sold in open markets uh, as slaves. So while these wars which are... Which we didn't have before Congress, when he was which, there? Which didn't uh, exist before. No? And so so while... You, well, sorry, let's just, just finish this one, one point, because uh, we feel for the suffering of people in these countries, and we want to be able to help them. And so many of these wars are, are begun and waged from a, a place of humanitarianism. Yeah. But the reality is, and it's a harsh reality, that there 
there is more suffering and more loss of life and more destruction as a result of these wars, which does not serve the people in these countries, nor does it serve our interests and our security. Congresswoman, um, first, thank you for your service, which is something I say to everyone who has served that, come on, that comes on the show, and I think it's important. Um, that being said, my understanding is you know how I feel about your stance on foreign policy, and when I hear the name Tulsi Gabbard, I think of a Assad apologist. I think of someone who comes back to the United States and is spouting propaganda from Syria. You have said that the Syrian President Assad is not the enemy of the United States, yet he's used chemical weapons against his own people 300 times. That was a red line with President Obama. That's our, that is not our enemy. 13 million Syrians have been displaced. So when you say regime change is hurtful for the country, but gassing children isn't more hurtful, it's hard for me to understand where you come from a humanitarian standpoint if you were to become president. Uh, well, you're putting words in my mouth that I've never said. You did not say all. that Syrian President Assad is not the enemy of the United States. Say it now. Clarify. <laughs> the, the issue here is how can we help alleviate the suffering of people. Just really one moment. Is he an enemy of the United States? An enemy of the United States is someone who threatens our safety and our security. There is no disputing the fact that Bashar al-Assad in Syria is a brutal dictator. There is no disputing the fact that he has used chemical weapons and other weapons against his people. There are other terrorist groups in Syria who have used similar chemical weapons and other weapons of terror against the people of Syria. This is, this is an unfortunate thing that wrenches at every one of our hearts. This is not something I'm disputing, nor am I apologizing or defending these actions. My point is that the reality we are facing here is that since the United States started waging a covert regime change war in Syria starting in 2011, the lives of the Syrian people have not been improved. Their well-being has not gotten to a better place. Their suffering has not decreased. It has increased in addition to the fact that Al-Qaeda is stronger in Syria today than ever before. So not only are we dealing with the fact that this regime change war we've been waging in Syria has not helped the Syrian people, it has made their lives worse off. Bashar it has also, his people it has has also undermined our national security, leaving us in a place where Al-Qaeda is a stronger threat there than they ever have now, been before. Tulsi, Tulsi. And Iran has greater influence in Syria than ever before. Tulsi, you and I know each other, and uh, you and I have have had these uh, discussions and arguments over text and over phone. I've told you over how, how much, yes, mm -hmm. how we uh, disagree. <laughs> People text, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, how we disagree on, on, on you know, this issue. We've had it on the phone as well. I'm also, I'm, I'm very troubled by, by the tweets about Venezuela mm -hmm. that you've put out, you know, that, you know, we, we've talked about that. What Maduro is doing to the people of Venezuela, there's over three million that have been displaced. People are starving. He's not allowing humanitarian aid in. He is a thug. He is a dictator. He is corrupt. And I, I am very supportive of what the United States is doing right now, leading the solidarity and support of freedom-loving Venezuelans and putting sanctions, economic and, pol and uh, sanctions. Why are you so against uh, you. intervention in Venezuela? Not military intervention, but what we are doing. Because every time the United States, and particularly in Latin America, has gotten involved in regime change, using different tools to enact that regime change, there have been both short and long-term devastating impacts. If there are ways that we can work with surrounding countries to try to get humanitarian aid into people there, then we should be doing that. But for the United States to go in and choose who should be the leader of Venezuela, that is not something that serves the interests of the Venezuelan people. That's something that they need to determine themselves. But the U.S. Themselves. is not choosing who's going to be the leader of Venezuela. It's, you know, it's millions of Venezuelans marching on the streets. Just, so, just but do you put military intervention on the same level that you put economic and uh, diplomatic efforts? The United States has used both military, CIA, sanctions and other tools to intervene and enact regime change in countries around the world. Uh, Iran is a great example. Uh, the CIA led a covert operation to overthrow uh, the government in Iran decades ago in Mossadegh. This led to decades upon decades of hardship and suffering and authoritarian governments and has led us to the place where we're dealing with many challenges we'll come today. To from yeah, we're going to come back with more from you because I think you have more to say on this than you should. Um, I'm just wondering if this particular position that you take is going to be a popular one in the Democratic Party. 
Uh, this is a position that I have found many Americans appreciate and understand because we understand that every one of us is paying the price for these regime change wars that are not helping people in these countries and they're counterproductive to yeah. our interests at home. I believe Trump said something similar when he was running. Did he not? Am I wrong about that? I'm he may have, curious. but the problem yeah, is he, that has he's not, doing it. he has not carried through. No. He has gone back and, and has uh, uh, broken his promises. Okay. All right. We're going to keep you. We'll have more with Representative Tulsi Gabbard when we come back. Deal.com. We partnered with vendors for at least half off products that'll make you hotter than the red carpet on Oscar night. So get to ViewYourDeal.com now. And we are back with Representative Tulsi Gabbard. And again, you are the first Hindu to run for president. So we want to get just a sense of where you stand on some of the issues. We've talked a lot at this table about the newcomers on the Democratic yeah. side uh, being quite progressive on a number of issues. Uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, a Democratic Socialist, has right. raised the most money so far of all people. Are you for the Green New Deal, for example? Uh, I first got involved with politics as an environmentalist. I've fought uh, very hard to make sure that everyone has clean air to breathe, clean water to drink. And I think we need to take serious action to address climate change. Uh, I have some concerns with the Green New Deal and about some of the vagueness of the language in there, so have not uh, co-sponsored that resolution. What about uh, support for free four-year college tuition? I think that's something that we can achieve. I think we have to not only look at how can we provide this access to education, but also how do we address the high cost of higher education uh, student loan debts and increasing uh, interest rates there, as well as how can we leverage technology to both increase access and bring down the cost of education. And what about universal health care? That's also something I think that's achievable. You know, it's unacceptable. Do you believe in this it's a right of I every do. American? I do. I think it's unacceptable in this country that uh, we spend far more on health care than any other country in the world with far uh, worse outcomes. So does that mean every no single, more private health care? Every purposes? single American should get the health care that they need. If there are... It, it, yeah. I think it... it I think everyone with the heart, that sounds great. You know, you want to give that, but there are realities and costs to that. Mm -hmm. Does that mean taking away all private health care? Because you got to get pretty specific when you make a statement like yeah, that. Yeah, sure. No, I real. think there's, there's two questions here. One is Medicare for all would provide quality health care for every single American at a cheaper price to every one of us than we are currently paying for health care currently. Uh, if folks want to get their own private insurance at the same time, they're free to do that, but making sure that we have this basic quality level of care for every American is what Medicare for All would do, and that's what I support. Okay, gotta go. All right, thank you so much Thank for being you. with us. Thanks for having me. All right, Representative Tulsi Gabbard, we'll be right back.